Hey everyone, welcome back. Now, before I roll into today's topic, i like to give you guys a little bit of an update on my Ace Generation Civic SI. Now, in a previous video, I had discussed what my next plans were for my Ace Gen, and one of the biggest things was tackling the dreaded paint issues, that clear coat failure that's, that plagues all of Ace Generation Civics and some other Hondas as well. But that was pretty much one of the biggest gripes I had about my car and probably was probably the only thing that was wrong with the car. Um, in the six years that I've owned it, I have pretty much addressed all the mechanical issues. They were very little, but I had addressed all the weaknesses, strengthened them and just making sure the car was a very dependable and basically just a turnkey vehicle. I turned the key, it starts up all the time. That was pretty much the goal of this car because it is my daily driver. But anyways, um, that was one of the biggest gripes I had and that's now being worked on. I have pretty much sent the Ace Generation Civic to the body shop. So you'll, you'll be seeing me driving this 2020 Blazer and also some other vehicles as well until my Ace Generation, I get it back from the body shop. It might be next week, it might be a couple weeks, who knows, but um, I will keep you guys posted on that. But also, if you're new to my channel, my Ace Generation Civic SI has sort of been a main character on my channel hence you know it's my daily driver and that's also why you see it in a lot of my videos now getting back to the car that i'm driving this is a rather low mileage 2020 chevy blazer now this you know people's definition of low mileage kind of varies but this is a 2020 it has about 17,000 kilometers on it which is pretty low because i know some people even some people in my circle have a car let's say it's from 2019 and that shit's almost got 160k not that I'm a mileage queen or anything like that. I tend to drive the least out of my friends. So I guess that's why it seems like I drive way less than they do. But um, yeah, um, this is considered, I well, at least I consider it a pretty low, uh, low mileage, a low mileage vehicle. Now, I'm not sure what trim this is exactly. Um, I probably should have done that before I started this video, but I do know that it comes with a two liter Ecotec engine, which has been a staple in many of GM's vehicles. This makes about 190 horsepower and it's got to push this 3,800 pound vehicle. Now, to be honest, this is a little underpowered for this car. If I were to own one, which I probably wouldn't, but for this video's sake, I would rather go with the 3.6 liter LGX V6. Not because it makes 300 plus horsepower, but because it has enough torque to propel this massive car. Now, since the common public is so intertwined with SUVs, um, this one that I'm driving in particular may come off as normal size or even a little bit on the smaller side to some, but still, to Chevy's credit, they're one of the few automakers out there, mainly in Canada and the U.S., still giving us a V6 in this kind of segment. Because a lot of people, they're moving away to four-cylinder hybrids and stuff like that. It's still really nice that you can get a good old torque converter paired to a nice V6. That's sort of, that sort of was sort of the de facto of this segment, although a lot of people have bought the four-cylinders. In my own personal experience, longevity-wise, it kind of seems like the V6s were a little bit better in that regard, but my experience might be a little bit different to yours. Now, to shout, now I'm going to give a huge shout out to my friend Peter. So, Peter, if you're watching this video, this is kind of the reason why I'm making this video. So, if you're watching this, I'm calling you out. <laughs> Now, I was pretty much trying to convince him that the three-cylinder engine that comes in the Jira Corolla was a pretty stout engine, despite its size, but simply he couldn't shake the fact that it was just so small. And I think that has to do with like how, it, how small engines are represented in North America. In general, we take a lot of influence from American call culture. <laughs> Now, going back to the GR Corolla's point, um, it does come with a very, very small engine, but I don't think it is sort of a negative point to the car as people might think it would be. I think it actually adds a lot of character to the car because it has a very unique soundtrack. It has this really angry power. It's just like, I'm tiny. I'm sick of you larger engines always, you know, taking the high ground and everyone accepts you. You know, why can't I be? I, I sort of get that character from it. And... Let me tell you, it does put it down 
in a pretty good manner. And again, I would say this would be one of the cases where it would be a correct way to properly downsize your engine without it making, you know, without it being extremely boring and lame. Because let's face it, with these tiny engines, while they may be different from manufacturer to manufacturer, they all kind of give off a similar vibe. Nothing really special to write home about. This can also be said with the two liter turbos that reign supreme in Europe. But with two liters, I feel like that should be plenty enough there because majority of the um, engine sizes there are, you know, one pretty much ranging from the one to two liter. So two liter might be large there. And in North America, that might be considered a small engine. Um, but in North America, where cars are much bigger and heavier in size, these smaller engines are just simply not going to cut it in terms of physicality and other various factors, which I will be saying later on in this video. In order for you to even save fuel in a car like this, you would probably pretty much be off boost. And when you do hit boost, your fuel economy takes a hit. And it's pretty much the same thing in my car. When I hit VTEC, fuel economy is thrown out the window. It's not even a talking point anymore. <laughs> um, but I was just pretty much left thinking, isn't the main purpose of these smaller engines supposed to be better on gas? That, that was my like thought process on it. And this is something that a lot of car makers just don't seem to understand. They don't seem to get that weight plays a huge role in efficiency. Yeah, we can have batteries, we can have all this stuff. But the fundamental thing is if you're lighter, that's less fuel being burnt, that's less energy, you know, being take to move such an object. That was sort of my thought process. But, you know, car makers have been just pretty much focused being just equipping all these cars with equipment and technology without taking in mind the trade-offs that you'll be taking. Still to this day, a dinosaur of a car, if I remember correctly, it was a fifth generation CX. They had a trim. It came it also came with a 1.5 liter and only made around 90 horsepower, but it was sort of like a stripped down civic. It had roll up windows. It didn't have a radio. I don't even think it came with air conditioning. And that car is able to achieve 50 miles per gallon. And this was in 1992. And I'm pretty sure modern cars can achieve that. But look at all the extra stuff they got to do just to even come close or be in the same ballpark with that number. While I do like my Hondas, this car is extremely old and this wouldn't even come close to meeting today's safety standards. Now... There is a completely wrong way to go about this. And one, you know, this one hasn't been mentioned a lot on the internet, I find, is the one and a half liter three cylinder that comes in the Nissan Rogue. Now, this engine was supposed to be groundbreaking by introducing VC or variable compression technology, but it just seems it's just been plagued with issues. And before I go off on this, in theory, it seems to be pretty good because like, you know, you could have a high compression engine for like performance, acceleration, and you can have low compression, you know, when you want to save gas, you know, when you want to chill, cruise with the boys, you know, listen to some music. But it just seems sad because it's just like they're bringing out this new engine. It's been plagued with issues and it's pretty much <laughs> Nissan already has issues with their transmission. And now they kind of have another issue on their ends. And, you know, this engine, you know, it's been out for a couple years and there's a lot of people reporting problems that, you know, engine failures at really low mileages, which is kind of crazy to hear about nowadays. Now, as a car guy, I can tell you a three cylinder motor powering an SUV like that is kind of silly. If it's some motor that's been built, it's an engineered, it has a big turbo on it, meaning you can take the stresses, sure. But getting back to the point, cramming this small engine in here and doing everything else under the sun to overcreate such a simple formula to save on gas, simply pairing a small engine to an SUV that really isn't meant for it, you'll be pressing the gas more often compared to, let's say, the same model with a larger displacement engine. Now, do you guys remember how I mentioned Europe a few times? It makes sense over there to have those small displacement engines because 
their cars over there overall like all cars are much smaller than you know their american counterparts now if i recall there was a ford focus i believe it was the mark III generation and it came with the one liter ecoboost and it made about 120 ish horsepower now i'm not like being a support for downsizing and saying it's the right thing but it all depends how it's done and if there is the efficiency to back it up then you could have a solid a to b you know city car you know car you drive every day whatever and the one liter you know ecoboost that was in this ford focus actually defeated the larger 1.6 now one liter 1.6 may not seem like much but in you know europe they make a little bit of a bigger deal in north america one liter are you crazy how could that even push a lawnmower that that's sort of like our mentality here but the main point i bring up this car is it got the formula down right which was missed by so many newer cars for north america i think one one and a half liters would be the smallest size entry you can get on average there might be some smaller ones in circulation that i don't know about so um if you guys can you know put down in the comments of some examples down there now the most heinous example of engine downsizing and you guys have probably heard about this one is the current c63 amg it comes with a two liter turbo pushing up 469 horsepower and it also has an electric motor providing 204 horsepower combined they make 670 horsepower with 752 pound feet of torque i'm sure this is faster than a generation but I hear physically this powertrain weighs even more um, than the larger displacement 4 liter twin turbo V8. I tried to give it a little bit of a chance because, you know, hybrids tend to do pretty good at launches if it's a more performance based hybrid. But I feel like at its, at its core, its core value, it kind of lost it. Like pretty much was... The C63 was synonymous with a sophisticated V8, which was sort of a nice alternative to the angry V8s, you know, we had here in our American vehicles. Now, since I've gave you guys a couple examples where engine downsizing works and where it's just downright wrong, can we really say it's killing performance? I don't think it's killing performance. I think it's just packaging and application that will determine if downsizing is really worth it or not. A good example and a pretty obvious example, which I probably should have started the video off with, is the 10th generation Civic Si. There's been numerous reports of people easily getting 30 miles a gallon and even close to 50 in some regards. And that's just from the little turbocharged one and a half liter. The K20 and K24 in past Civic Si's would dream of getting that, you know, fuel mileage. Now, does it lack character? Sure, but in terms of small displacement, which Honda has a lot of experience in, it comes in an excellent package that doesn't sacrifice fuel economy and power. It still makes over 200 horsepower, just like the K20 and K24 did, but the fuel economy is what, you know, the previous generations couldn't replicate. These often had pretty bad fuel economy, sometimes the worst in the range, but that's the trade-off when you want to have fun. You got to trade off something. Now, I'm going to close off by this saying, if you are choosing a car with a small displacement engine, see if you're truly getting the benefits from it compared to your last vehicle. And if that happens to be the case, go for it. We've definitely made some progress in this department, but I would just say just avoid the bad cases where you have a huge mass of a car with a tiny engine. Usually that doesn't go well in terms of economy, you know wear and tear you know this might be hit or miss some people might have a three-cylinder engine and they could say oh i've i've had no problems it's been a great engine and then other people might say oh you know this has been problematic it's been in the shop like i thought this brand was supposed to be reliable but i guess not so it's pretty much a mixed bag all over the place but if you want my personal opinion that is pretty much it just do your research see if the formula works well, see if the numbers work out. And if they do work out, then you could say, you know, downsizing is, isn't so bad. As for, you know, the main point, I really don't think it's killing engine performance. I think it's just the perception of these tiny engines and how they're packaged. I think, you know, if we can figure out one of the, 
well, not one of those two things. If we can figure out both of those things, I think we might see, you know, more of these come about with like hybrids and stuff like that. But yeah, 